sure everyone knows Heather as well as some of our other speakers, but we're delighted she's going to talk to us about SDRs and GNU radio, because that's where the future lies in, this, in these technologies. Uh, despite Mr. Renault's uh, view of uh, the world. <laughs> it's all right, Heather and John are sitting next to each other. Um, Heather's got a PhD in digital imaging, image processing, started her career developing hardware and software for Ford instrumentation and engine management. Now, there's a very long list of all the things she's worked on, but uh, in view of timing, I'm not going to list them all for you, but uh, there's some very clever things that she's been involved in during her career. She, was she, she, uh, she retired in 2015, and she now finds a little more time to, uh, for, for her hobbies of amateur radio, software and hardware design, and vintage and classic car restoration, so an interesting mix. Uh, she got her amateur radio licence in 2014, but Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you. I don't know if I can live up to that, but I, I guess I wrote it. So, <laughs> so um, the first question is, who's got an SDR? Brilliant. Okay. And who's got a cell phone? <laughs> okay, so basically the point made, cell phones, like all, almost all big commercial radios, are SDRs these days. 7300s, everything that coming out these days. It has software in it. That worked really well, didn't it? Sorry for that. That's all right. Oh, I need a dongle. Okay. So um, this is an introduction I'm going to skip over because most people have got SDRs here. I'm going to try and skip over the, the overview quite quickly. Um, Wikipedia has a, a complicated and rather long-winded definition. Everyone you talk to has a different definition. Um, but for me, it's really all about where you put the ADCs and DACs in a, a radio. And we can put it in AF, IF, and RF. Um, that's a conventional radio. Filters, mixers frequency sources, the usual sort of thing. So I'll briefly talk about AF. Um, the takeaway from this is this work by uh, this guy called Warren Pratt. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever got involved with him, but he's done some absolutely amazing stuff. And he, there's some YouTube videos if you want to go and look for his name. Um, mostly done in Linux. and. He, he can get a signal which he, you can just about hear that there's there's some CW going on and it becomes completely readable. Um, so getting into the audio world, PC sound cards, that's what most of us probably are going to be using for if we're going to go this route. Um, and I want to just give you an example here, this uh, Cirrus Logic device, 24-bit giving 120 dB dynamic range, which for most people doing radio is... is quite phenomenal. So if you want to be at the other end of the spectrum in the LF and VLF, um, down below 192K, that's a good place to be and gives you an example of what you can do. But for most of us, we want to worry about IF and RF. Um, this is a typical system. You've got a PC or a small board computer. That's laser. Okay, no, laser's not talking to me very much. Um, over here we've got usually an FPGA, ADCs and DACs, some sort of high-speed interconnect, drivers and decoding software, and then something to, to actually do some processing. Takeaways from this slide, the IQ modulator and demodulator, we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, decoding software, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with SDR Sharp, and I'm going to say a bit about GNU Radio and uh, virtual cables, which mean you don't have to plug audio into microphone inputs. Um, so you can route all the, all the audio around inside your PC. Um, pan adapters, that's one of the great things that SDRs have brought to us. Um, 
that's I took that on my home system. There are three monitors. It's about one and a half meters wide. Um, so you've got a a big pan adapter, and uh, you can get down to about 600 hertz resolution on that across nearly three gigahertz of bandwidth. So if you're looking at your IF two meters, you can see the whole thing in enough detail that you can pick out most of the um, CW channels and certainly all of this, this uh, SSBs. So what else can we do? Concurrent receivers, I'm sure everybody's heard of the, the web SDRs. You can have a lot of receivers um, all working on the same IF, two and a half megahertz of bandwidth. So if you're contesting and you're capable of writing the software, you can be actually demodulating everything that's going on on the band at the time. Um, obviously, you've got to point your dish at the right place, but um, yeah, very powerful and you can do a lot there. I'm sure we'll see in the future people having systems which will monitor where everybody is in a contest. Um, certainly on the um, VHF stuff we listened to recently, uh, there's a lot I think can be done there. Um, because you're doing SD, uh, the, the ADCs at high frequency, you can do a lot more work at IF. You don't have to bring it all down to, to baseband to, to play with. And in fact, for most SDRs, baseband is the up to 60 megahertz of bandwidth. So uh, it, there's a lot, a lot you can do there eventually. And, and I should say, people aren't really doing it at the moment. They're, they're really turning SDRs into normal radios. And I think this is where it'll get interesting for, for us as people interested in something slightly different. Um, Averaging spectrums, another good thing. We've got a, a little demonstration out in the projects thing, uh, uh, doing spectrum averaging um, over 10, 15 seconds. Uh, so you can really get rid of the noise almost completely and just see your signals come out of the noise. And uh, base stations for 100 pound, you can buy a bit of kit now that will do a 2G and 3G, sorry, 3G and LTE base station, if you ever want to go there. Um, very quickly, that's all the stuff that you can do with a free um, software and an RTL six pound dongle. I'll take one out the PC later. Um, from SAQ up to uh, 1.7 gig on that device. So you, you have lots. I'll, I'll try and skip over some of this. Cost of entry. This is one thing I wanted to say. Six pound for one of those little blue SDRs. All that software on the Pass screen is free, um, and if you've got a PC, you're doing that sort of thing. Um, a suitable antenna, um, and and you're made. Uh, if you want to go for a transceiver, transmitting is obviously the hard part of SDRs these days. This little guy, the Lime SDR Mini, hundred pounds when it's uh, available in the UK, and uh, you're there. Um, so don't be frightened of it. It's it's the sort of thing you can just throw a few pounds at and play with. And I think that's part of the beauty of, uh, of SDRs at the moment. The other big thing people say, it's I like a radio with knobs on, people say. Well, you can add them. Um, I don't know this guy, Mike, but uh, he's, he's done a, a nice thing with some knobs on it there. And you can buy nice knobs that are USB uh, wheels, uh, effectively. So it can be done. And uh, obviously, if you're going to get into writing software, you can just add a bit of hardware to whatever platform, the Raspberry Pi or something, and uh, read positions of rotary encoders or whatever. So there's a lot you can do there if you want to do it. Um, but most SDR manufacturers are just pointing people at uh, completely software mouse-driven stuff. But it doesn't have to be. A um, couple of other things to look out for. Um, DC to 6 gig um, sounds wonderful, but remember that you've only got two or three bands up in the microwaves on that range that you can use. So yes, you can do one, two, three, four, five gigahertz, but you're not allowed to transmit on them. So these things appear to be giving you a huge <laughs> amount of stuff, but in reality, um, it's not quite as big as it sounds. And the big thing to worry about they all need LNAs, filters, PAs, the usual sort of stuff. So when you buy an SDR, 
you're not getting everything that you're going to get if you go and buy a 7300 or something like that. Okay, let's go inside an STR. All about ADCs, as I've said. Um, if you've got the money, $1,326 will get you a 3 giga samples per second direct conversion ADC. Um, more usefully, 16-bit um, at 130 mega samples a second, which will cover the HF, or you can go up a bit higher to uh, around about 100 pounds will get you something that will cover two meters and UIFs. Um, signal to noise, interesting problem. Um, you get a lot, 86 dB from a 14-bit device, but you get a lot more, and we'll take a look at that later. Um, but look out, if you're looking at specs, effective number of bits. A lot of people say, oh, it's a 24-bit device, but its noise floor is 22 bits, 21 bits. So bear that in mind. It's an important um, differentiator, I think, between a, um, different ADCs. And that little blue SDR that I've got down there, um, <coughs> it's only 7 bits, but using decimation, we get a lot more effective number of bits out of the software. Um, so we'll come to that. FPGAs, they all have FPGAs on them, but <coughs> some form or other. This is the, the full Lime SDR, it's 300 pound odd. That's the, uh, the FPGA in the middle there. It's doing all the work. And basically, you're taking your microwave signal, mixing it to something, let's say, a few hundred megahertz. Um, then you want to turn that into something you can actually get into a PC. Um, good SDRs like the Lime, 60 mega samples a second. So you're getting the whole of HF and 50 meters and you know, a lot of data in one go. You could process the entire HF spectrum on your PC, every single conversation, every single CW. You could do it all at the same time if you've got the processing power. The other end of the spectrum, that little six quid thing, I keep coming back to him, only 3.2 mega samples a second, so you can't quite get the whole of the HF band. Um, but USB 2, I've been using it quite successfully on a um, Pentium 2 uh, 1 gig computer, so you don't have to be up there with the latest four, five, six core things. So IQ modulation, this is where it gets interesting. The old fashioned way we're all familiar with, you get the sum and the difference and you've got to worry about it. New way with IQ modulation, you keep the same basic idea. You phase shift both signals by 90 degrees. So now you sign of both of those, add them and you get the difference. If you subtract those two, you get the sum. So you don't have your image, in theory. That's what it tends to look like. You'll see that sort of diagram in any sort of uh, IQ type mixer. In pictures, you start off with a bit less than two hertz, mix it with something one, two, three hertz, and old style, you get the sum and difference. So you've got your one and your five. With this one, you've got your, you take your sine and cosine. I've given the example for the IF. You do the same for your um, local oscillator. You mix them together. If you add them, you get the difference, and you subtract them. So it's nice until you get into the real world. I'm sure we all recognize the problems. And all the blue stuff there is where things are going wrong. So you've got errors in phase, you've got errors in um, DC offset, and errors in gain. But because we're doing everything in software, we can calibrate it all. We can basically pre-distort everything and get back what we want when we actually mix it. And at 80 down, dB down with that little SDR, you're almost in the range where you don't need to worry about filtering, almost. Um, I'm sure Sam will argue the, <laughs> the point about it, but it, it's, it's up there. Um, and it will get better, I'm sure, as people get better and better hardware. 
um, six gigahertz mixer uh, analog devices do one for about seven pounds so uh, um, this technology is there you can design with it yourself if you want to I'll talk a little bit about the software inside these things um, what can you do well basically everything that that Wikipedia article said filters direct digital synthesizers we'll talk a little bit about them these mixers we've talked about um, FFTs another very powerful way of looking at things and processing things um, and the line at the bottom an important thing to bear in mind everything in software has a delay most of your analog stuff is going to be pretty much there instant your mixers give you an exact thing whereas because all this software stuff is doing it at clock rates you are getting delays and you need to trade that off if you're doing fairly clever stuff mostly with the, the digital modes um, but for voice uh, we, we're talking milliseconds of delay at worst case so uh, you're not got a problem with CW or voice but you might have a problem with some digital modes so I'll talk a little bit about a couple of those this this is a about as far as I go in terms of understanding the, uh, the signal theory um, but the, you'll see this sort of chart on a lot of digital DSP type processing the important takeaway here is that this box is just a one clock delay so the way this filter works is your signal comes in it gets multiplied by this coefficient and added one clock cycle later your first sample has moved to here and you've got your second sample and now you're doing these two and eventually you filled the whole buffer and things just drop off the line off the end on each clock and this type of filter does almost everything you can do your high pass low pass because you put the two together you can do notch reject and various other things as a hill put transform we'll look at in a minute um, so these things they look scary but they're actually trivial um, and they of course you can probably see we're talking a shift register at the top we're talking about multipliers and adders this is very easy to do in hardware even outside of using a processor this is easy to do okay DDS another one of those things this is just a thing that is creating samples that represent a sine wave so as time goes by this bit of software will produce numbers that represent points on a curve very very useful for all the mixing stuff that we want to do in software we want to say right we'll create samples that look like our sine or cosine and uh, this phrase cordic which is um, quite an old method of generating sines and cosines has been sort of repurposed now into FPGAs that's where this sort of thing is at decimation this is a lovely thing um, basically you're taking a high bandwidth signal reducing the bandwidth getting more data um, more bits of resolution out of it this example we've got a one Hertz sample at one kilo sample a second so we've got a thousand samples on this graph but we have only got a nine level A to D converter so it's it's very blocky we do a simple filter on it I've used a moving average here and you get a moving average filter but it's still sampled at kilo sample now we just add every 10 samples produce that as our new sample we're now sampled at 100 Hertz but you can see that you've got a much better resolution there if you're going from as an example at the top even taking 20 mega samples go down to 19 kilohertz you've got 140 DB FS on paper um, and as long as your input signal is good you will actually get that because it's all in software there are no losses Hilbert transform is another interesting one um, this guy's sort of to signal processing what Marconi is to radio he, he did some of the serious work and um, what I'm interested in here is that there's a Hilbert transform which you can implement with that filter that we looked at earlier giving you a plus or minus 45 degree sh phase shift of your signal so in software we can use this guy to generate sine and cosine by generating a minus 45 and a plus 45 shift so we get the blue one is the, uh, the input signal we've got time delays but 
you can see that there's the, the red and the uh, green are 45 degrees plus or minus 90 degrees apart in total. Okay, so once we've got all this done, we want to do some signal processing. One thing we can do, we talked about going to the FFT, one of the things that computers are quite good at. We start with a signal like that. If we want to uh, get rid of some frequency components, we want to get rid of our mirrors or noise or whatever, we just set those buckets, the FFT points to zero, and they're gone. Um, so that is just that simple. Then if you want to uh, frequency shift it, you just move the frequency buckets the values to the different buckets. Job done. You've just demodulated, removed the mirrors and the uh, interfering signals. Do it in reverse, and it's that simple. It's a little bit more complicated because of the way FFTs overlap, but um, I'm sure you can see that uh, that is an awful lot easier than doing filters and mixing and all the rest of it. So that's one way we can do stuff. Um, Let's have a little bit of a look at GNU radio. I don't know what time it is right now, but hopefully we've... Someone tell me what time it is. We're about halfway through on time. We're about halfway through on time. Oh, brilliant. Okay, we're, we're whizzing through there. So GNU radio, it's one of the ways of playing with the output of an SDR. Um, what it isn't is a complete radio. It's basically a collection of building blocks, all the things we've just talked about and hundreds more. Um, it's free, it's open source, you can go and play with it, you can write your own stuff. It's not perfect, a lot of people are using it, um, and a lot of commercially available SDRs come with a GNU radio interface, so this is what I would like to encourage people to go and have a play with. It took me um, about an hour last night to download it on my hotel, uh, it runs on Windows, it ran first time, can get it for Linux, you can get it for Mac, so whatever you want to play with, you can go and do it. And one of the great things that they brought out recently, you can create a USB drive of it, just plug it into any PC, and you'll be in there in a preset environment. A few people I've spoken to have tried to play with this and found that setting stuff up can get difficult. Um, now you just plug in your USB or your DVD, boot off that, and you've got a fully working environment. So. I quite encourage people to, to go have a look at that. I think it's quite fun. Um, originally, GNU Radio was written as a Python scripting language, which it's OK, but it means you need to be a programmer to get into it. Then they came along and they produced this thing called the GNU Radio Companion, which we'll take a little look at. There it is. I'm sorry, this is a bit of an <coughs> eyesight test. We'll, we'll move on to some things, but basically, you draw pictures, you connect stuff up. So um, things to take away from here. This is the play button, the make it do stuff, the run button, whatever you want. I have no idea why it is the least obvious button. It isn't even coloured. Um, but um, yeah, there it is. Um, who knows? But here you go. There's a little bit of one. Uh, I've created a low-pass filter. I've created an audio sync, which is somewhere to put the audio, in this case audio sync is uh, uh, the uh, speakers, and a GUI, a graphical thing, which will actually, in this case, look at the signal in time. It's an oscilloscope. And down the side here, um, that's all this thing here. You can see there are lots of stuff you can do, and there's lots more under each one of those hierarchies. Um, but there's some filters, high passes, low passes, our friend the Hilbert transform here. Um, it, th there's a lot there, and if you can't find it, it's not that hard to go and write your own. So um, I started playing with this. Um, I don't think Andy Talbot's here today, is he? No. So Andy and Radcom about three years ago um, did a, a little article on the third method SSB generation. And he'd done it, an article, and he put it in a PIC processor, and he'd written it all, and he said, oh, why doesn't somebody write this in uh, a DSP and do the whole thing? And so it took me about an hour and a half, two hours. I did it all in GNU Radio. Um, here we can see, again, we talked about 
filters, different high pass, low pass. This example, I'm just creating a sine wave, which is my frequency source, 750 kilohertz. But I've got the, the option of plugging, and this is disabled in grey here, but I could plug the microphone in here. Um, here I've got the 1.5K, which is switching thing. A delay is same as a phase shift. Um, I look at that phase shift on the oscilloscope, so the, the signal and a delay on a time sink. I'm multiplying these, it's amplitude 2 offset minus 1, so it's going plus or minus 1. I multiply it in those two, I low pass filter and out comes on the speaker one of the channels. If it was stereo then it would come out <coughs> on two channels. And uh, that's it, an hour and a half of playing and I've done it. It's not, this isn't a design, this actually runs, this actually does the thing. Out of the speakers you get the audio, the SSB <coughs> baseband audio, out of the microphone you actually get what you're speaking, so that's it. And um, if you want to change something, you think, oh, well, maybe I want to run faster, or I want to look at some other things, you can put another time sync in, you can put a Fourier transform in, you can do all this, and it takes literally seconds, whereas if you wanted to change your uh, gain in something, um, you've probably got a few hours of design theory to, uh, to work on. So that's where it becomes powerful. You want to play with these things. Um, the output, when you run it, Obviously, you're going to get some sounds out of the, the speakers, but that's uh, also, we had these time sinks. So here you've got those square waves, plus or minus one, and uh, the, the two different 90-degree um, phase differences. And there's the two audios. And as it's running on the screen, these will be updating and changing um, within your uh, in what you see. So uh, there's, there's a fair bit you can do there. And as I say, it took me about an hour maybe to, to do that. It certainly took me a lot less to do it than Andy took to write the article in the first place. So. Um, and here's the one that uh, hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate. Um, we've got the RTL dongle. That's this little blue thing. It's currently tuned to 103.9, which is actually... It, it, it's slightly off that now. I don't know what it is, but it's an FM radio station. Low pass filter with decimation. So we're getting seven bits out of here. We're getting loads more bits here because we've got decimation. I'm resampling it. You remember in that decimation example, I said we were adding up uh, the, the values and then treating those as our uh, reduced uh, sample rate. Then I've just got a wideband FM receiver single block, drop it down, and at this point I have demodulated FM, and if I plugged this onto here I would just listen to the radio channel. Interesting point here, the blue boxes are I and Q signals, they're complex signals. So all the way through here I'm using I and Q versions of these pieces of software. At this point I turn into just a single digital sample floating point in this case. So out of here I'm getting something that I could put into a speaker, out of the radio I'm getting I and Q, and uh, that's it. So that's most of what we've talked about um, going on in there. Um, I've added in here a signal source, this is just a 1.7 kilohertz sine wave generating a nice signal. I'm adding the two, just literally adding. This in orange has been disabled and I'm putting this out. So what I should hear is radio. I'm not sure what the channel is, but it's voice or music or something, with an annoying tone added onto it. And we'll see if we can get that to work. If you bear with me for a few seconds. The, um, the yellow part is a filter. And the purposes of the filter will be to first demonstrate this. Now, hopefully, we can hear it. So, so in almost as much time.
time as it took to say it, um, we've implemented a complete FM demodulator, put an annoying interfering signal in there, and we've got it coming out of the speakers of our PC. And we could equally well have had the microphone in there if we had a, a bit of hardware that could transmit, then we would, obviously, we could be doing that the other way around in just the same amount of time. And I mentioned earlier that you could do brick wall filters. Um, if I just enable that filter, um, which is, I think you can see it's a 1.695 uh, to 1.705 band reject. Um, so I'm just taking out 10 kilohertz, so um, 10 hertz, sorry, of the uh, the output bandwidth, which is where that signal source is. So if you treated that as if it was an annoying signal that you're getting on your demodulator, you should hear no annoying tone. And, uh, well, no annoying tone that wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 when, when I got it working yesterday, I was using classical, classic FM, which was a good signal, but we can't seem to get that here. So, And that's it. Um, yeah, uh, questions? playing with this and the light bulb moment for, for me was when I realised there really is nothing else to do apart from drag these blocks into a block diagram and press play and it works. You don't have to look at the code, you don't care what happens in the code. And the first thing I did was I got a source and I got a sync and I generated it so it came out of my PC speakers. And then within Five or six hours of playing around with this, I had an FM receiver running the same as you. But the light bulb moment, and I think sort of looking around the black, some of the blank faces I was looking around, <laughs> it is really that easy. You drag these into a diagram, and, and if everything works, it checks it, and you press play, and you've got your work consistent. Don't get any dry joints either. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a light bulb moment. It's, like, oh, yes. it's, it's scary, and it's full of big words, but it's not. <laughs> One of the things you put in right at the beginning that is inherent into all of the software to find radio boxes is rate changes. Mm -hmm. Now, the maths is all very fine and you can look, look through and the theory fits well. But in the real world, and as a radio amateur, I'm interested in ultra weak signals. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really ultra weak. Where your signal might be less than one bit on average above the noise. Mm -hmm. Where you start to use things like virtual audio cables and the rest for changing rate, mm -hmm. you actually degrade your signal to noise. Yeah. And that is missed out in a lot of people who say, ah, oh, you can use this or use an SDR dongle for 3065 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, that actually, as you go through the various stages, whether it's GNU Radio or SDR Sharp, is that the more stages you go through that involve a rate change, the more you lose weak signals over an analog, what you have in the analog receiver. And there doesn't seem to be any maths to actually take you through that very easily. I've not found it. Have you? No. Um, it, the, you're, you're only going to be worrying where your weak signals are oscillating resolution-wise within one bit. Yes. Um, if you've got a signal that low, then you, are have to, you will have to go to analog. But if you start with an RTL dongle, you've yes. only got seven or eight bits to start with. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And but seven you, or eight bits is a big signal. Yes, yeah. Um, if you've got yeah, 128 levels of sampling, if, yeah. if you can get within that with your weak signal, you're fine. You can digitally process it. If, if I may. Of course. I may. <laughs> there is an answer, John. Yes. And the answer is, you look at the bit of theory that talks about 
sampling with noise with dither yes, added to the no, signal. No, you and see, that's the point. You can't dither out a single no, bit no, no, of signal. No. No, the, di the dithering happens at the beginning, at the A to D. Yeah, you can't. No, it, if, you've got a, if you've got a noise, sorry. <laughs> if you've got a noise signal that is less or is more than your single bit of noise. It has to be. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, so if, you, if you've got that and you've got a single bit resolution of the sorry. data, you can't see it. You have to have more than one bit of resolution. No, forgive me, you don't. And the, problem is, <laughs> the, problem, the problem is, this is that's the problem that comes, was addressed very early on in the theory. These days, very few, very few A to D converters have genu genuinely have dither added. But it's, the, your, John is right, there are issues, but it's, with lots of things, you have to track, you have to suck it and see if it, how good the silicon is, because there always comes a point at which the analog side of things will be letting you down. But there, there is, but the, what, and the another issue with it is you have to go quite a long way back because it's not a topic that's well covered in textbooks. No, not at all. Well, <laughs> well, that's a subject for a, long, for, for a beer on another occasion. <laughs> so we, we could say you know, Paul, my partner, actually invented the idea of, of putting dither into uh, A to D's to, to get resolution. But you can't get resolution out of an A to D with less than one bit. But um, this is a very key issue for people who do moon bounce. Yeah. Yes. And people who do moon bounce and use virtual audio cables and virtual string in their PC after an SDR, invariably a losing, losing signal as opposed to those that analog process and then use a bit okay. overkill on the number of bits yeah, in terms yeah. of signal to noise. But um, it it's a very hard amateur issue, this, that seems to get missed. I should say that with almost all the, you, you probably saw some of this stuff that we've had, um, there is a sample rate in here, 48k for everything I'm doing here. And you do have to get all of that to match up properly. Um, when I put that little radio together, this one, originally I got this sample rate wrong. I was running at 22, and it, uh, the decimation was running at 48. And you lose it. It's just a horrible signal. You could tell it was there, but you couldn't do anything with it just because the sampling was wrong. And as soon as you get all the sample points together. So if you're using a virtual cable, my advice is go in at 48, go out at 48, don't do any rate changing. If you're going to do rate changing, do it after you've done a good low pass decimation filter, because that will give you the extra bits without losing the, the resampling errors, um, because you're resampling with a much, much higher resolution. Yeah, but it is a good point. I mean, it, there are limits. Yeah, there are limits. Any other questions? <laughs> a few things coming on the stream. So, oh, okay. first of all, Andy G for JNT is on the stream. So oh, right. Oh, hi, Andy. <laughs> um, and he was uh, <coughs> saying that the virtual audio connects is far too much hassle, and using two sound cards and transferring it as real audio is probably the, the easiest thing that he's <laughs> found. Well, he'll do that, but he's going to the analog domain and back into the digital domain. Yeah. Um, I, I, have, I use this thing, DB cable, and I've got very, very good results out of it. Never had a problem with it. As long as, I'll come back to John's point, you keep the, the sample rates constant throughout the whole thing. Anything else? From there? There's a lot of people on there, a lot of people saying hello, and uh, <laughs> hello. Else. so I think you've got 48 viewers at the moment, so a lot of interest, so okay. uh, it's good. Any other questions? Or we, uh... a, lot of, a lot of these SDRs are, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14 bit, yeah. and even at 14 bit, the sort of direct dynamic range is not the best in the world. Well, as I said here, the, <coughs> what you just heard was FM radio demodulated on I think it was 15 kilohertz on a 7-bit device. Decimation is what gives you that extreme increase in uh, resolution. So, yes, um, if you go to something like the HP SDR, 
um, I think they're now using 18-bit oh, okay. for HF, yeah. direct sampling. Um, once you do that, now bear in mind that there you can't use a, this type of um, demodulation because you're, you're actually direct converting. Um, whereas, obviously, I'm, I only wanted out something with a 48K samples, 24 um, ki kilohertz bandwidth. So I can do that bandwidth reduction, but I couldn't do that if I want to direct sample the HF because I want to actually know what's at the HF. So hence, they go to 18 bits. 18 bits is pretty good. That's giving you a, d a dynamic range of nearly 100 dB, I think. Um, so uh, if you can get the hardware to do it and actually give you 18 bits rather than 16 or 15 effective bits, um, yeah, it, it can be done. But it is a point. Analog will always win on the resolution of the input. Um, Uh, so, uh, many of the audio converters use a technology called Delta Sigma. Mm -hmm. Single bit. Where you start with a one bit A to D converter running at five or six megahertz, then you use decimating filters, one to reduce the sample rate, but two to give you the extra bit. So, you wind up with an 18 bit apparent converter which starts off as one bit, and that's what Hi Fi is built around. And and back to front the digital to analog converters that we all have in our MP3 players and so on do exactly the same thing the other way around. So it's not magic, it does really work. And one of the things that is, is quite interesting if you get, say, a digital input on an FPGA, which you can run maybe at a, a couple of gigahertz, um, you can then process using noise. <laughs> um, if, as long as you've got that one bit of signal, um, then you can then you can go use your noise and you can get as much decimation out as, as you want. So you could do a non a, a zero D to uh, sorry D, zero D to A F F F B G A based uh, demodulator um, with, without ever going into analog, just direct sample digital from the start. Anyone else? No? Okay. okay, well, thank you very much, Heather. That's certainly you. got a few of the, uh, the brain cells working, <laughs> I suspect. Um, what I was going to suggest was that we got Robin to stand by one door and say, John Worst not to stand by the other door, and none of you can leave unless you give a credible explanation of how to set a bucket to zero as you go out. Whether <laughs> 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 that was really useful because it got people thinking and it did try and get across the message that this is where things are going. Um, I suspect we might ask you back another time to take us through the next steps. But uh, for today, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.